Well, good morning. It's nine o'clock. I'm going. Uh, I advertised on social media this morning that we would be uh, starting at nine o'clock, so I'm going to try to stick to that and get that rolling. So uh, other people will be uh, trickling in here as we get started. Uh, you guys should have in front of you a set of notes for Lesson 92. The Two Streams of Bibles model of transmission is Origins and Accuracy, Part 6, overstating the case for the critical text is what we're going to be looking at. Okay. Now this, is, uh, this particular set of notes is, is 10 pages. Now three of it we're going to go through really quick because it's just a recap, just a quick recap and overview of what we've done uh, since September. Okay. So I want to get right into that, get through that as quick as possible, and then get into the uh, new content for what I want to cover today in Lesson 92. So again, this is Lesson 92, Two Streams of Bibles, Model of Transmission, Its Origins and Accuracy, Part 6, uh, Overstating the Case for the Critical Text. Okay, So we started the third term of this class with Lesson 57 back on Sunday, September 9, 2018. Seems like a long time ago, Okay, uh, but that's when we started. With a, and we started with a summative review of preservation. Lesson 57 was designed to reboot the course after a year hiatus. Recall that we took a year off so that I could work on some continuing education credits for my secular job. The goal of that lesson, or this lesson, uh, I'm referring there to Lesson 57, was to review the main points from Terms 1 and 2. I also introduced a new point about the connection between preservation and predictive prophecy. Okay, So at the end of Lesson 57, I set forth the following focus for Term 3. So this is what I said back on September 9, 2018, we were going to be doing uh, during this past school year. Term 3 would primarily focus on the issues of canonicity and transmission. In terms of canonicity, canonicity we will consider the following issues in detail. I said... First, false views of the canon, and then second, a scriptural view of the canon. On the matter of transmission, we will trace the text of preservation from the pen of the apostles in the first century till the publication of the authorized version in 1611. Uh, this will not be an easy task. So that's what I said at the end of Lesson 57 back on, in September, on September 9, 2018. While we did not quite succeed in making it all the way to the publication of the authorized version in 1611 as originally intended, we blaze quite a trail in terms of a comprehensive teaching about canonicity and transmission. Lessons 58 through 68, which I taught on December 2nd, 2018, were devoted to a study of canonicity. During these lessons, we have considered the we had considered the following topics. Okay, so I'm just going to list them here. This particular document, once it's made available on the internet, would also sort of serve as an index for this term, okay? So that I, I'm trying to accomplish two things with this, not only to review what we've talked about, but also to have a sort of an index available for uh, term three on the internet. So in lesson 58, we talked about the concept of canonicity. I introduced you to canonical models in lesson 59. Lesson 60, we talked about community determined models the historical critical model, the Roman, top page two, the Roman Catholic model, and the existential neo-orthodox neo model. So we went over that in lesson 60. In lesson 61, we looked at the historically determined models of the canon. There, we looked at the canon within the canon model and the criteria of canonicity model. And then in lessons 62 through 67, we looked at the self-authenticating model, which if you recall is the one I taught you I believe is the correct one, okay? Lesson 62 was an introduction to the self-authenticating model. Lesson 63, we looked at corporate exposure, divine qualities and the Holy Spirit in lesson 64, corporate reception in lesson 65, the apostolic origins of the canon in lesson 66, and implications in lesson 67, okay? Then we ended that and transitioned out of a conversation on canonicity into a discussion of transmission with Lesson 68 by looking at manuscripts and Christian book production forging a link between canonicity and transmission. So again, we did all that in Lesson 68. Okay? More recently, we have been studying the history of preservation by looking at the transmission of the text throughout history. Lesson 69 was the first lesson on that. I taught that on the uh, 9th of December uh, of 2018 through what we're doing today, Lesson 91 on 6919. Okay? 
So, uh, so we've been looking at this topic of transmission since December. Now you might think that you couldn't do that, but you could, and we probably could add more to it if we really wanted to, but Lesson 69, we looked at the introduction to transmission, the history of preservation. Then we looked at transmission, transmission and textual criticism, the importance of presuppositions in Lesson 70. We looked at approaches to, to transmission, preservation, or reconstruction in Lesson 71. In Lesson 72, we continued looking at that, approaches to transmission, preservation or reconstruction, part two. And we looked at uh, Bart Ehrman versus Daniel Wallace, absolute certainty or total despair. We looked at the materials and witnesses in the transmission of scripture in Lesson 73. Then we looked at false assumptions concerning transmission, that it required verbatim identicality of wording in Lesson 74. We did a, a second one on that in Lesson 75, false assumptions and the idea that it required verbatim identicality. Lesson 76, we looked at verbatim identicality case study, William W. Combs and Richard Flanders. Then we looked at textual variance and corruption, defining our terms in Lessons 77 and 78. Then we looked at these case studies of do textual variance impact doctrine, in Lesson 79, we looked at the case of Mark 16 and the Ascension of Christ. And then in Lesson 80, we looked at the at 1 John 5, 7 and the heavenly three heavenly witnesses. Then we looked at principles in Lesson 81, principles for identifying the preserved text in history. Normal transmission from Paul to Tertullian in Lesson 82. Normal transmission of four controlling factors in Lesson 83. Normal transmission, application of the four controlling factors in Lesson 84. Normal transmission, the stream of transmission in Lesson 85. Then normal transmission, the Paul scenes and the preserved text in Lesson 86. And then most recently, we've been looking at the two streams of Bibles model for transmission, its origin and accuracy. In Lesson 87, we looked at the Gothic Bible, Lesson 88, the Peshitta. Uh, lesson 89, the Old Latin, Latin Vulgate Dichotomy. Lesson 90, the Adventism of Seventh-day Adventism of uh, Wilkinson. And last Sunday, we looked at J.J. Ray's Plagiarism of Wilkinson. So we've done a lot. We've done all that in nine months, okay? You guys need to realize that you've been sitting through potentially a graduate-level class on this issue for nine months. Mm -hmm. So you should, you know, write yourself out a diploma. Just no final exam. Just no final exam. I promise there won't be a final exam. Although it would be interesting to make one. Okay. <laughs> So, as the four list chronicles of late, we have been analyzing the origins and accuracy of the popular two streams of Bibles paradigm of transmission. This morning, as a means of bringing term three to a conclusion, I would like to offer some conclusory thoughts on the two streams view of transmission, okay? Now, if you remember last Sunday, one of the things we talked about was how um, certain individuals want to hang the origin of the King James only position, if you will, on the uh, writings of the, of the Seventh-day Adventist Wilkinson, right? And I talked to you and gave you some examples of how people before 1930, when Wilkinson wrote that book, said things favorable to the King James. So I was doing some study and some research this week, and I found this book here, The Menace of Modernism. This was written by a guy named William B. Riley. This particular book dates, copyrighted 1917, and he's discussing in here what he calls the old conception. And what he means by the old conception is the state of belief within the church before the modernist controversy of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, I'm not going to get into all that. If you want information on that, I could direct you to the Grace History Project where we talked about the confrontation between fundamentalism and modernism in the late 19th, early 20th centuries in America. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because under a section called the Old Conception, where this particular author is describing the old belief that Christians had before this controversy came on the scene, after the writing of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of the Species in 1859, after the publication of the critical text and uh, the revised version in 1881. So there's been some things that he's talking about. And he says here, quote, on page 9, so I only printed what I was going to read, on page 9, he says, there are at least three features of the old conception, each of which has now passed away. So he's saying, these are the ways Christians used to what? Think, and he's saying, this way of these three things have now what? 
passed away. In other words, people no, are no longer what? Thinking. thinking like this. Okay, and here's what he says. They are first, but the Bible was finished in heaven and handed down. Second, that the King James Version was absolutely inerrant. So you need to think about that. Is he saying that people before the controversy used to believe that? Yeah. Hey, yes, one. Doug's daughter and Heidi and his grandson Titus are here. Okay. Come on in. Okay. Good morning. So on the table there is a set, our sets of notes about what we're going to be uh, covering. So uh, we're going to be starting here in a minute when I finish this point on page four of those, of those notes. So anyway, what, 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 he was, what Riley is saying here is he's identifying what, believe, what people used to believe before the controversy. And again, I'm going to read that on page nine. He says, there are at least three features of the old conception which have now passed away. So again, th these are the ways people used to think and believe, but now they're what? They're, not, they're thinking differently, right? right? The first one again was that the Bible was finished in heaven and handed down. Second, that the King James Version was absolutely inerrant. What's he saying about the way people used to think about their English Bible? He's saying that, that before the modernist controversy, did they think it was absolutely inerrant? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. And three, third, that its literal acceptance and interpretation was alone correct. There's three important points there, folks. Number one, there's the point of where the Bible came from, from God in heaven. Number two, that their English Bible was completely inerrant in their King James Bible. And number three, that their English Bible should be interpreted literally, which led to the rise of dispensationalism in the English-speaking world. Okay? Three critically important points that he identifies as having been a part of the commonly held belief before, before the controversies over modernism and fundamentalism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So I give that to you as yet another example of the point I was trying to make last week at the end of Lesson 91, okay? So let's continue, though, with Lesson 92 at the top of page 4. So, summative problems with the two streams model of transmission. So this is, this is a summary of what we've been doing, essentially, since Lesson 87 when we looked at the Gothic Bible, okay? So first, point number one. First, an analysis of the extant textual data reveals that the Gothic, see Lesson 87, Peshitta, see Lesson 88, and Old Latin, see Lesson 89 translations, are mixed texts, i.e. they contain readings in their extant witnesses that King James advocates do not tolerate from the critical text or modern versions. I've showed you that, I've demonstrated that to you over a period of time now. Therefore, they cannot be placed in a monolithic stream or line of textual purity supporting the received text and or the King James Bible. Some of their readings support the traditional text and some do not. Consequently, their witness must be considered on a case-by-case -case or reading-by-reading -reading basis, speculating as to what the original state of the Gothic, Peshitta, or Old Latin versions may have been will not solve the problem since they are not extant. In other words, do we have original copies of those translations? No. no. Okay, so look at my next sentence. Such speculation on the part of King James advocates is dangerous and inconsistent since we do not accept the speculation, the speculative surmising of naturalistic textual critics in their efforts to reconstruct the lost text of the original New Testament autographs. So here's my point. Will we accept that type of speculation from critical text modern version proponents? No, no. No. So we should therefore then not enter into the same realm of speculation that we will not accept over there just because we perceive that it fits our, our overall thing that we're trying to do over here. Okay? We have to evaluate the data as it is, as it actually exists. And as it actually exists, these things are mixed. Okay? Now, I did not have time to put into this lesson some further discussion on that, and I'm thinking in September, when we start this class again, that's where I'm going to pick up, okay? Point number two. Second, this two streams of Bibles paradigm is built upon erecting a false dichotomy between the old Latin, the good Bible of the Waddensians, and Jerome's Latin Vulgate, the bad Bible of the Catholic Church. Evidence gleaned from the Vulgate, evidence gleaned from Vulgate readings considered in Lesson 89 
reveal that the Vulgate is a, is a mixed text, as are the Peshitta and Gothic Bibles. The textual facts do not warrant the placement of the Latin Vulgate in an opposing stream of transmission from the Peshitta and Gothic. Moreover, the data does not suggest a dichotomous relationship between the Old Latin and the Latin Vulgate, as two streams advocates have suggested. Rather, the Vulgate is a descendant of the Old Latin, possessing, now this is important, possessing more confluence with its Latin predecessors than with Aleph and B. Now what does that mean? That means that the Latin Vulgate has more in common with the Old Latin than it does with the two principal witnesses to the critical text, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex what? Vaticanus, okay? The, old, the, the Latin Vulgate is more like the Old Latin than it is these two. I showed you that, okay? Yet, in two streams of argumentation, the Old Latin and Vulgate are placed in opposite streams of transmission. Such a placement misrepresents the facts which show the Old Latin, the Old Latin and the Vulgate to be more closely aligned against Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus than against each other. Furthermore, how does it make sense to paint the Vulgate as wholly bad, evil, or corrupt if it is helpful to establish the authenticity of certain received text King James readings? In this case, it is anti-Catholic bias on the part of fundamentalists that has demonized the Vulgate out of hand rather than looking at its actual readings. So I'm going to say this again. Do not think that I am saying that I am in favor of the Catholic Church. I am not saying that. Okay? I'm saying that we can't just say that's bad by waving a magic wand and declaring it to be so without actually evaluating the data. Does that make sense? Okay? Lastly, when judged against the mixed extant witnesses for the Peshitta and Gothic versions, the Vulgate is no less mixed. Why then do the Peshitta and Gothic get placed in the pure stream of transmission while the Vulgate is rele relegated to the corrupt stream? When judged by the extant evidence, the situation is not so clear-cut as the dichotomous reasoning of the two streams paradigm would have us believe. The fact is that when the Peshitta, Gothic, and Vulgate are judged against the twin standards of the received text in Greek and the King James Bible in English, all three are mixed texts, and the two streams of transmission notion thereby dries up. In other words, it what? It's not going to work, Okay. The two streams of Bibles model of transmission is guilty of presenting a false dichotomy that is not supported by the textual facts. This is dangerous because if one bothers to check the facts, they run the risk of having their faith overthrown by information that does not fit the either or option presented by the dichotomy. Bible, now let me just say, again, I confronted that problem. I said to you in lesson 87, that I believed this, I had accepted this, I had read this in all the literature, and I, I, I didn't think to question it that, it, that it was true or not, okay? But when I actually did and I started looking at some of this stuff, I found things that were very deeply troubling to me because they were not in line with what I had always been led to believe. That doesn't mean, though, that I throw the King James Bible out and adopt a modern version. No, what it means is I just have to rethink through what? Through the issues, okay? Bible believers need not, and here's this, so I kind of get to that in the next point. Bible believers need not fret over the facts on the ground. The Bible does not teach the two streams dichotomy. Does this book here ever teach that? No. No, okay? Rather, the Bible teaches that God would preserve his word and that Satan would attempt to corrupt it. It does teach that. It teaches how God would preserve it, the dichotomy was developed in the 20th century as a rhetorical device to answer the attacks of modern textual criticism against the received text in the King James Bible and stave off the incursion of modern versions into the English-speaking church. We are working towards being able to fully articulate an alternative what? Model. Okay, now that's a mouthful there. Can we move on to the next point? Okay, number three. Benjamin G. Wilkinson, the fountainhead of the two streams of Bible model of transmission, did not base his paradigm on an evaluation of the textual facts. In fact, one can read his chief work, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated from 1930, as well as his reply to his critics 
within the Seventh-day Adventist church, that was covered in Lesson 90, without finding a single textual example to support his paradigm. Okay? Instead, Wilkinson took the conclusory statements of previous authors and assembled them in a particular manner and constructed an argument. No one before Wilkinson had ever strung together this impressive line of citations to make such an argument. So what he does is he lifts quotations out, he lists them out, he strings them together into an argument, and then to clinch and to seal the deal, what does he say? Read the next sentence. Next, Wilkinson added the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the spirit of prophecy and appealed to the writings of Ellen G. White to corroborate his strung-together chain of citations. Okay, now we've been over this. Therefore, Wilkinson's argument regarding the two parallel streams of Bibles is a massive appeal to authority with some heretical Seventh-day Adventist teaching mixed in for good measure. It is important to note that Wilkinson's dichotomous treatment of the Old Latin and Latin Vulgate were born out of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine regarding the spirit of prophecy. Um, I shouldn't say said there. Maybe which said. Which, I'm sorry for that poor sentence there. Uh, were born out of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine regarding the spirit of prophecy and regarding the Waldensians. So let's mark that sentence. I'll fix it later, Sylvia and not a textual evaluation of the facts. So the point is this. Did Wilkinson look at the Old Latin and the Latin Vulgate to come up with this, or was he basing it upon the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine about the Waddensians from Ellen G. White and the Spirit of Prophecy? Okay, so we went over that. Now, while I object to Wilkinson's Seventh-day Adventist defense of the two streams model on doctrinal grounds, the main reason why his transmissional paradigm dries up is because it does not accord with the historical and textual facts. The substantive basis of the two streams paradigm is built upon sinking sand rather than upon an evaluation of actual readings. The net result
Testament, the answer is an emphatic no. Okay, We need to judge the so-called corrupt stream outlined above or, or, excuse me, on our three scriptural principles for identifying the preserved text in history, okay? Recall the following from Lessons 69 and 81. When approached from a believing viewpoint, a study of transmission is a study of the history of preservation. Once again, our job as believers is not to reconstruct the text as though it had been lost, Rather, our job is to allow the scriptures to be our guide in identifying the text that God has preserved from generation to generation, mm -hmm. right? That's how, we're, we're not to be fooling around out here in the dark trying to find what was lost. Our job is to identify what was never lost and preserved, Amen. okay? Seems to me that's the believing viewpoint on that, all right? Now, the following scriptural principles will assist the believer in identifying the preserved text. Number one, now we've been over this at least three or four times already. Number one is a multiplicity of copies. In Lessons 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, and 53, we studied the process and people of preservation in both the Old and New Testaments. In doing so, we observed that God's design was to preserve his word in a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that were just as authoritative as the originals. Therefore, we ought to be able to observe in history a collection of manuscripts that are plenteous, meaning what? A lot, of a lot of them, okay, that are plenteous and in substantive agreement with each other regarding doctrinal content despite not possessing verbatim identicality of what? Wording. Wording. Now, we've been over that and over that and over that, okay? Number two, available and accessible. This principle is covered in Lesson 55. The preserved text would not only exist in a multiplicity of copies, but these copies would be available to God's people to possess, study, copy, believe, translate, and preach from. They would not be hidden under a rock, buried in the sand, or an inaccessible library or monastery. In other words, God's intent in having his word, inspiring his word in the first place, was for believers to what? Have it, read it, study it, preach it, know it, memorize it hide it in their heart, so on and so forth, right? So the, the believing approach to this is that the text is going to be accessible. It's not going to be hidden away or locked away where nobody can what? Get to it. Get to it, okay? And three is in use. A third biblical hallmark of the preserved text would be use by God's people for generations. God's word was preserved through the dynamic of people handling it. Not, now listen, not in one copy, sitting on a bookshelf for 500 or 1,000 years, far away from God's people who are actually doing the work of the ministry. That is not the way God preserves his word. He preserves his word by being in the hands of Bible-believing people, and those people are charged with the responsibility to execute God's purpose. Okay? So, this proposed... So what I want to do is I want to apply those three principles to that alleged corrupt stream. So everybody following what I'm doing here sort of as a the, the, the thought development of this lesson, okay? So the proposed corrupt stream, that's this stuff right here, identified above, containing critical text, contain, should say containing the critical text, supporting modern versions, fails on all three counts to pass the test of Scripture, okay? Number one, it has few manuscript witnesses that substantively it has few manuscript witnesses that substantively, that should say, disagree with each other, not agree. God has few that agree. It has few manuscript witnesses that substantively disagree with each other. That's what it should say. Okay? Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus differ with each other in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone. Okay? Number two, <clears throat> its principal manuscripts were not accessible or available to believers throughout the dispensation of grace. Codex Sinaiticus was not even known to exist until 1859. Codex Vaticanus is not entered into the catalog of the Vatican Library until 1475. Okay? So, are we really saying that the true text of, text of Scripture was locked in the Vatican Library or hidden away in St. Catherine's Monastery for the better part of 1900 years? 
Okay, that is not what the believing viewpoint would teach you to think about how this would happen. Okay, and three, given their lack of availability, they certainly were not copied and or used by Bible-believing people during the church age. They can't be used and copied if no one even knows it exists or if it's under the exclusive control of the Vatican for at least since the time of its known first known um, existence. Okay, is everybody with me? So we're trying to apply those three principles to that stream, to that thinking over there. Okay? <clears throat> so the modern critical text, now th so that would be everything from there up. Okay, on that, on that chart, on that listing, that would be everything from there up. <coughs> the modern critical text with a ninth, was a 19th century creation of textual critics based upon the primary witnesses of two Greek codices, Vaticanus, or B, and Sinaiticus, Aleph. These two codices disagree with each other in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, many of which are substantive. Meaning, they're not just different ways of saying the same thing. They're substantive differences in what? Meaning. Meaning, they are reporting to you content that is substantively what? Different. So they differ from each other, not only, so they are differing from each other in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, okay? <clears throat> Moreover, they were inaccessible to the body of Christ throughout the dispensation of grace because they were not even known to exist until the 15th, in the case of Codex Vaticanus, and 19th centuries, respectively. Lastly, they have no history of ever having, you, ever having been used and or copied by the body of Christ. On this point, quote, Pickering states, No amount of subjective preference can obscure the fact that they are poor copies, objectively so. They are so bad that no one could stand to use them, and so they survived physically. In other words, can we put our hands on the physical documents? Mm -hmm. Yes. So they survived physically, but had no what? Children. Children, since no one wanted to copy them. We have no evidence of these texts ever having been copied throughout the history of the church. Okay. So are they in use? Why are they not in use? They're not in use because they're not what? Available. The only reason they survive physically is because previous generations of Christians identified them as poor and therefore refused to what? Use them. Okay, top of page seven. Now, some people are going to get mad at me for putting it this way, but this is how I think it. This is my... Opinion. The critical text is a Frankenstein text. Okay? Now, I don't mean that to be mean. I mean that to be an accurate word picture of what it is. It's a Frankenstein text that was cobbled together by text critics in the 19th century using an eclectic method. Here's the thing. Everything from here up, okay? Westcott North text, all this stuff, the revised version that it's based on and so forth. No member of the body of Christ had ever seen such a text, much less used a text like the one printed by Westcott and Horton in 1881. They've never even seen something a day in their life, much less have it be used, because what they do is they take Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and they mix it all up to produce a wholly new what? Greek text. Okay? So this is wholly different than anything that is what? Before it. Before it. You can't go before 1881 and find anything that resembles what's going on above that line before that point. Which is why I think this model of two streams is given all that information more credit than it what? Deserves. deserves. Okay, so let me finish my points. The publication of the critical text was the fruit of lower criticism's application of Enlightenment rationalism upon the biblical text. Therefore, to assert that the critical text and its resultant modern versions are part of the stream of corruption 
stretching all the way back to Nicaean antiquity in 325 AD is to overstate the case and give the critical text more credit than it deserves. Whatever, all of this is so unlike everything beneath here. And what this model is doing is is it's hiding from people that if you're up here embracing any of this material or any of this information up here at the top, you are embracing something that is so wholly different even from this Reims New Testament from 1582. This is not a monolithic stream of systematic corruption. Are there things in there that are corrupt? Yes, but there are, they are not even the same as each other. I should have drawn these two, two things in separate circles, and I did that for a reason, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Okay? So, while this, while there, now look at the next sentence there. While there was corruption of the New Testament text, to be sure, throughout the history of the dispensation of grace, such corruption was random, isolated, okay? It should say, and not monolithic, not systematic, and or sequential, as has been argued by the two streams advocates. You guys following what I'm saying here? You guys with me? Yes, no, maybe so? All right, well, i got to keep going, so. <laughs> Recall from Lesson 85 that Dr. Wilbur Pickering argued in the identity of the New Testament text that it is not even possible, based upon, based upon the principal witnesses to the critical text, Aleph and B, to reconstruct a cohesive textual archetype to compete with the Byzantine majority. This is what he said, quote, in his book, Alain's discussion of transmission of the New Testament text is permeated with the assumption that the Byzantine text was a secondary development that progressively contaminated the pure Egyptian Alexandrian text. But the chief Alexandrian witnesses, B, Vaticanus, A, Alexandrinus, and Aleph, Sinaiticus, okay, are in constant and significant disagreement among themselves. So much so that there is no objective way of reconstructing an archetype. In other words, do these things disagree with each other so much that you cannot even line them up to create a single systematic competing archetype to the Byzantine majority? Yeah. That's what he's saying. Okay. 150 years earlier, the picture is the same. P45, P66, P75 are quite dissimilar and do not reflect a single tradition. In AD 200, there was not a king in Egypt. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, or so it would seem. But what if we were to entertain the hypothesis that the Byzantine tradition is the oldest and that the Western and Alexandrian manuscripts represent varying perturbation, is that how you say that? Perturbation? Perturbation. On the fringes of the main transmissional stream. Would this not make better sense of the surviving evidence? Okay. There would be no Western or Egyptian archetypes, just various sources of contamination that act in such a random fashion that each extant Western or Egyptian manuscript has a different mosaic. In contrast, there would indeed be a Byzantine archetype which would reflect the original. The mean text of the extant manuscripts improves century by century, the 14th being the best, because the worst manuscripts were not copied or worn out by use, whereas good ones were used and copied and were worn out and discarded. Okay, so remember what, so Pickering says there's one stream of transmission, right? The representative of the 95% majority witness, which feeds into the Texas Receptus, which ultimately feeds into the King James Bible and what? In English, right? And he says that all these are what? Eddies. Remember that? What's an eddy? It's what? It's a side pool of water that just swirls along the bank of the mainstream of transmission, right? So not, so not only are these eddies cut off from the mainstream of transmission, they're cut off from what? Each other. Each other. There is no stream. There's this stream. There's one stream coming through history of the preserved Word of God. The rest of this is just random what? Random corruption. Okay? That is not only cut off from the mainstream, but that's also cut off from what? 
each other. Each other, the other examples of what? Corruption. So to say this is what happened is to actually misrepresent the textual data. Now, does that mean we overthrow our belief in our King James Bible in English? No. no, it means we just have to adopt a more correct way of thinking about it. Okay? <clears throat> Bottom of page 7. I don't know if this is still recording. It started, it decided it wanted to update right in the middle of this lesson. So we're missing like the main point. I might have to reteach this. But you're here, so I'm going to finish, okay? Technology. Just when I trust it and don't have the other camera, what happens? There you go. So if one cannot even construct a cohesive textual archetype to compete with the Byzantine majority, for manuscripts listed in the alleged corrupt stream, how does it make sense to say there is a, quote, stream of corruption? There's not a stream of corruption. There's random examples of what? Corruption. corruption but they are not in a systematic what? Order. Stream. Okay? Such a stream does not exist. Therefore, Dr. Pickering argued that the Aleph or Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, papyri, I'm just going to say pyri, papyri, are best viewed as eddies, or pools of water swirling along the mainstream of transmission that are cut off from each other as well as from the main transmissional stream. Recall the following figure presented by Dr. Pickering. So go to the top page 8. This is, this is a simplified version of what he has. Okay, but it's essentially communicating the same thing. <clears throat> Dr. Pickering explains his diagram as follows. The manuscripts within the cones represent the normal transmission. To the left, I have plotted some possible representatives of what, of what we might style the irresponsible transmission of the text. The copyists produced poor copies through uh, incompetence or carelessness but did not make deliberate changes. To the right, I have plotted some possible representatives of what might be styled the fabricated transmission of the text. The scribes made deliberate changes to the text for whatever reasons, producing fabricated copies, not true copies. I am well aware that the manuscripts plotted on the figure above contain both careless and deliberate errors in different proportions. Okay? Skipping the parentheses. So... That any classification such as I attempt might be relative and gives a distorted picture. Since I venture to insist that ignorance, carelessness, officiousness, and malice all left their mark upon the transmission of the New Testament text, and we must take account of them in any attempt to reconstruct the history of transmission. The problem with modern text critics is they don't acknowledge the role of the adversary in the transmission of the text. Does the adversary hate, detest, and despise God's word? Yes. yes. So is he going to make attempts to attack it? Mm -hmm. Yes. We find upon consulting the witnesses, what we find upon consulting the witnesses is just such a picture. We have the majority text, Alan, or the traditional text, Bergen, dominating the stream of transmission with a few individual witnesses going their idiosyncratic ways. We have also seen the notion of text types and recensions as defined and used by Hort and his followers is gratuitous, meaning it, it, it doesn't fit, it's not going to work, okay? Epp's notion of streams fares no better. There is just one stream with a number of small eddies or circular movement of water contrary to the main current causing a small whirlpool along the edges. When I say the majority text dominates the stream, I mean it is represented in about 95% of the manuscripts. Okay? So is there a monolithic systematic stream of corruption going all the way back to Alexandria, Egypt? No. I'm saying to you that the answer to that is what? No. no. Were people trying to corrupt it? Yeah. Yeah, but are they connected in a systematic stream? They, all of these eddies are different, not only from what's going on in the mainstream of transmission, but they are all different from what? Themselves. Each other. 
Okay? In short, there are examples of corruption to be sure, but there is no stream of corruption as has been asserted by two streams advocates. The critical text reflect the, the critical text reflected in modern versions, now watch, did not exist until the late 19th century when it was created by textual critics. No, to place these modern creations in the same stream of transmission, along with the Latin Vulgate, and even the Catholic Reims New Testament of 1582, serves to mask the monster created by text critics in the 19th century. Recall our discussion in the following means. So what did I just say? What I just said is that if you include all the stuff above this dotted line and say it's in the same thing of what's going on down here, what you do is you mask how bad this stuff really is compared to what went before it. You're obscuring from view what actually the case is and how bad the case actually is. Okay, So look at the references there on that meme. So the NIV removes all 16 of those verses. This is just one example, okay? It removes all 16 of those verses are removed from the NIV, okay? Now, why are they removed from the NIV in English? Think about it. Why are they removed from the NIV in English? Because the critical text upon which they're based questions the authenticity of those what? Verses. Those verses, okay? Where did that critical text come from? It came from the cobbled together work of text critics who took all of this stuff in the eddies and constructed a new text and passed it off to the body of Christ as the original text. You guys following me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the Catholic Reims New Testament of 1582 is always placed in the stream of corrupt Bibles along with modern versions such as the NIV, New American Standard, ESV, and New King James, okay, as I have there on the board. I downloaded a PDF copy of the original Reims New Testament and checked to see if the 16 verses listed on the meme above were omitted. So I went to the internet, I found an original a PDF copy of an original 1582 Reims New Testament. I downloaded it. I have it for all, forever and all time in my files, okay? And I went to every one of these 16 verses, and I checked to see whether the Catholic Reims New Testament had that verse in it, okay? So these are 16 verses that the NIV does what? Omits, right? And I checked all 16 of these verses against the Catholic Reims New Testament. Again, I'm not arguing for use of the Catholic Reims New Testament, okay? I'm just making an argument here. I downloaded a PDF copy of the original Reims New Testament and checked to see if the 16 verses listed on the meme were omitted. My investigation revealed that all 16 verses that are missing from modern versions were present in the Reims New Testament of 1582. Every one of them was in it. Okay? Now think about that. Where's that? This thing here is not even remotely the same as what these guys are trying to pass off to you today as being the original text. Because this has all 16 of those verses in it, whereas these modern versions omit them based upon the critical apparatus. Okay? Now remember though, that's... That's not supposed to be the case according to this stream idea. You guys following that? So is the Reem one corrupt? Or well, I think the Reems has other problems. I'm not, so I'm not advocating for it. But it is not as corrupt as what we are being told is the original text today in 2019. Okay? And this, uh, this, this stream way of viewing it hides that. From view. Because what it does is it just, when very few people will actually look at this and check to see if it's the case. So look at my next point. 
Well, let me finish the, that sentence. Textually, one would be better off reading a Reams New Testament than, than they would be using a modern version. Now, I'm not saying the Reams still doesn't have problems, because I think it does. But it's not as bad as what is being we are being told today is the original what? Text, okay? Yet, the Reams and modern versions are listed in the same stream of what? Transmission. Okay? So, let me finish this. Next point. <clears throat> For these reasons... I believe that the two streams model of transmission is that the two streams model of transmission inadvertently strengthens the pro modern version side of the translation debate. Okay? Now this whole idea was put together by King James advocates. But as I've thought about it, I think what it's actually doing is strengthening the side of the opposition. Look at the next point. This is accomplished. So why would I say that? This is accomplished by hiding how dissimilar the critical text and modern versions are from anything that came before, including the Catholic Vulgate and the Reims New Testament. Anything above this line is so dissimilar it is it, is dissimilar from anything that came where before before. This is not a systematic monolithic stream of corruption. There are examples of corruption, but they are not in a stream. They are as, in my opinion, they are as Pickering says. They are what eddies eddies. There's no stream here. Now, one reason is because the two streams model. Now, so why would that be the case? One reason is because the two streams model was not based upon an objective evaluation of textual data, but upon the, con the conjectural doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Remember, did Wilkinson base the two streams model on a textual evaluation of the evidence or upon the strung together citations with the authority of Ellen G. White and the uh, Seventh-day Adventist spirit of prophecy sprinkled in? Okay. So why is this thing all textually awry when you actually look at it? The reason is because it wasn't based upon evaluating the textual facts in the first place. Okay? I further believe that this is one reason why critical text supporters and modern version advocates have not more heavily excoriated King James advocates for utilizing the two streams argument in their prosecution of their case in favor of the King James Bible. The reason I think they have not raised a bigger stink about it is because they have perceived that there's an element in it that where it actually what? Helps them. Okay? So, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Now, if you think I'm all wet and in left field, I'll certainly, you know, hear you tell me that. But I don't think this is, I don't think this is a stream. Number one, these things are not only dissimilar from the mainstream, the, the stream of transmission that actually exists, not only do they differ from this, but they all differ from what? Each other. And this thing that was birthed in world history in 1881 is so wholly dissimilar from anything that was used before it, and no member of the body of Christ, no believing person, from the day that the first that the apostles set down the pen and inspiration ceased, no one had ever seen a text like this, no one had ever used a text like this, nobody had ever preached from a text like this a day in their life until the end of the 19th century. Okay? You guys follow that? So, when he's writing this about the menace of modernism in 1917, so slot that in here, 1917, what's he say? He says, there are at least three features of the old conception, each of which has now passed away. Number one, they are first, that the Bible was finished in heaven and handed down. That's the way people believed about it before all this stuff happened in the late 19th century. Second, that the King James Version was absolutely what? Inerrant. 
He's saying that before all this mess happened, were there, were there, did the average Bible-believing Christian in the English-speaking world accept their English Bibles being the inerrant authority? Yes. Sure. That's what he's saying. Okay? But that's not the case now. Over 100 years later. Okay? Craig? So, you know, one thing I hadn't thought about today until we uh, started looking at that is uh, actually the, uh, the significant differences that started happening after Westcott and Horn got their hands on this whole thing. And, um, a while back, you know, when I first started looking at this myself, I heard a man say something, you know, if you uh, have somebody that asks you about this and they say that they read from the Greek, you could respond to them and say, which Greek? And that that's raised a lot. That the man that asked that man, you know, apparently was a pastor or something, that. And that pastor was caught off guard because he was like, well, what do you mean which Greek? He had no idea who Westcott and Horde were or what happened in 1881. <clears throat> and as we've been talking about this today, it just occurred to me, you know, that Genesis 3.1, as we believe it is true, is true, that the serpent is more, was more subtle than the beast, than any beast of the field. And that, if I look at that, that's, that's exactly what's going on there. And exactly what's going on. And I want you to think about the three things that this guy says. First, the Bible was <clears throat> first, the Bible was finished in heaven and handed down. That's inspiration. That's what inspiration is, right? They're question because of the controversy, they begin to question what? The inspiration of scripture. Second, that the King James Version was absolutely inerrant. That's what they have in their own what? Language. And third, that its literal acceptance and interpretation was alone correct. Leading up to this, there is a great resurgence in Pauline, dispensational Pauline truth occurring. This comes on the market, and all of a sudden now all bets are what? Off. Off. Okay. This is the way... I'm a, I am admittedly a Bible believer who also studies history. But what I'm trying to do is filter the history through the way this book should teach me to think about it. Okay, And when I do, I don't see. I see transmission. I see corruption. I see the corruption as existing. The Bible teaches me to know that there will be what? Corruption. corruption. But to talk about it in this model here as a stream misrepresents the facts and hides from people how bad the current situation actually what yes. is. So Transmission Turnpike. I'm going to read this to you and we'll be done. Okay, Transmission Turnpike forging a more accurate model. <clears throat> Based upon the historical and textual evidence we have considered, if one were to diagram the stream of transmission, it would resemble a highway. Transition, transmission turnpike, if you will, stretching from the first century to the 21st and beyond into the ages to come. Remaining squarely on the highway and thereby safely traversing time and history are the Greek manuscripts of the Byzantine majority, as well as translations, patristic quotations, and lectionaries that are in substantive doctrinal agreement with each other, despite not possessing verbatim wording. This mass of textual witnesses preserved and transmitted the pure text of Scripture. Okay, That is derived, folks. See our factors for identifying the preserved text in history on page 6. Is everybody with me? Okay? Number t page 10. In addition, we should expect to find some textual witnesses driving with wheels on both the highway and the shoulder. These witnesses are best viewed as mixed texts in that they contain pure readings as well as corrupted ones to varying degrees. While they, have been, while, they, while they may have begun squarely on the highway, they have drifted to the shoulder over time. Therefore, we would expect to find manuscripts in this category traveling with varying degrees of recklessness, i.e. differing amounts of purity and what? Corruption. So what are our examples from what we study? The Gothic, the Peshitta, the Old Latin, and the Vulgate. 
All of those are what? They're not all, they're not, they're, they're all mixed. They have some good reading, some what? Okay. Were they used by people during the dispensation of grace? Yeah, whether you want to admit it or not, they were, right? Okay. Lastly, Bible believers would expect to encounter Fords or found on road dead manuscripts littering the ditches of history. These manuscripts not only disagree with the readings of the majority, but they also disagree with what? Each other. These are the left for dead manuscripts of history that have no evidence of ever having been copied or used by the body of Christ. Their existence in the present is due to their intentional abandonment by the believing church in the past. These cars broke down on the, on the transmission turnpike and they were left for dead and abandoned. They were never copied. They were never used. They, were never, no, they weren't used for anything. They weren't even known to exist. The principal two of them weren't even known to exist until at least 14 or 1900 years later. Okay? It is these discarded vehicles or manuscripts along the ditches of the transmission turnpike that have been revitalized by modern textual critics and foisted upon the body of Christ as the original text of Scripture. And there are the examples of them there that are listed. Okay? So, we got a, we got, we've done a lot here in this nine months, and I'm already thinking about what we're going to do next. Somebody said, are you going to be done yet? And I said, no. <laughs> we still have more to do. Okay? Where we are, by the way, you guys that might be watching on YouTube, I hope you didn't lose the connection. Um, my iPad here decided to update in the middle of the um, study, and hopefully you got most of what I said. I really don't want to have to redo it. But I think this is a critical lesson that if it's not available, it's going to be a bad thing. So I might have to redo it at some point. Okay. Um, but where we're going to pick up next September is this part right here. Look at page 10, first bullet, first dark bullet. I want to talk about this statement. While they may have begun squarely in the highway, they have drifted to the shoulder over time. I think the evidence suggests that some of these things may have started out well, but as those languages and those things fell out of use by the body of Christ, and they rubbed shoulders against other things, that they started to pick up debris and remnants of other things, which is why we find them today in the state that they're in. Okay, but I'll comment on all that later on. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments? Craig. I just want to say one thing. I think, you know, I know you were saying this, but, you know, for me, if, if somebody hands me a Bible, the only <coughs> word that's been changed in that Bible is in 1 Corinthians 1.18, where it says, being saved instead of are saved. To me, that's a corrupt Bible. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't teach from it because, you know, I, what am I going to do, skip over 1 Corinthians 1.18 every time I get to it? Given the current state of affairs where we have better Bibles, I agree. If I were living in, I don't know, wherever, and all I had was what I had, I think I'd be better off at least using that than nothing. Okay? And that's where we get into that whole thing about some King James advocates say you can't even get saved out of a modern version. I don't personally believe that. But I do believe that those versions are contain substantive errors and doctrine. And that given the option to read something and preach and teach something better, you should choose the better option. So that's, that's my opinion. But these guys right here, they, they believed, there were people in church history that believed similar things. Remember I quoted the, 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 uh, Bethlehem, ba the Bethlehem Baptist Organization of Regular Baptists from Kentucky? from 18, the 1830s, where they moved to establish a new denomination in Kentucky, and they had as one of their points of doctrine their belief that the King James Bible was infallible. That was in 1830. Okay, so we're not doing anything here that's not unlike what people have done before us in church history. Okay, we got to quit. Thanks for your attention.